and it is our pleasure to welcome today Ray, Dr. Ray Hype. Ray is uh, joining us to talk about some of the uh, things that we're seeing in our classrooms and in our uh, in our practices, understanding the evolving needs of our students within a post-traumatic environment. And I know you all have been uh, talking about what you're seeing, and Ray has a national perspective on that. Ray, I'm going to stop sharing, going to invite you to tell us about yourself and to start sharing your screen and uh, help us to know how we can help our kids who have so much going on in their little brains today. Well, thank you, Deb. I appreciate that. And I appreciate everything you folks are doing as well. And as I get things set up here, let me tell you just a little bit about my own background. So you know, I'm just not some crazy person running around here talking about things. My background is actually as a former special needs program director, former gen ed administrator, teacher, and currently my title is specialist manager for School Health Corporation. But I join you today as a consultant. I work with districts throughout the country as we're taking a look at how we support our students. And the focus realistically since the pandemic has hit has been that idea of mental health, of anxiety, of how do we make sure that all of our students are able to function to the best of their capacities. And so those of you who perhaps have heard me speak before know that I will share stories. So get ready. We're going to have stories as we go through, but I also base everything that we discuss on research. So you'll see some things as we move into this that do have a solid research basis. This is not just a, hey, I heard this down the street. This is actual studies that you can follow up on along the way. Why do we need to have discussions like this? Because what we're finding is what you're already beginning to see and that our students are coming to us more anxious. And for some of our students, who may have neurotypical tendencies, they can escalate just as much as our neurodiverse students. And so what is it that we need to be doing that can best support them in an overall setting? What I always find interesting, and I found this interesting uh, you know, in my administrative roles as I do now too, there are way too many groups out there who are going to give you the magic bullet. You know, this is the program that's going to work for everybody. Here's one thing that you already know that I'm going to reinforce for you. There's no one size fits all. And as you go out and you work with your individuals, what I hope that you're able to take from today are a couple of thoughts and ideas about ways that you might approach them in a differentiated manner, as well as being able to adapt things along the way. You know your students, the people in the outside world don't. And so as you're bringing these things in and you're trying different activities, as you're doing different therapy strategies, have confidence in the true experts out there. And those experts are you. So as we move into things, sorry, the old administrator and me always make sure that we have activities to do as we go through. Don't worry. It's only a final exam at the end of this. So you can only take, you know, very good notes along the way. But here's what I want to focus in on. We're going to talk breathing as one of our strategies as we're going to go through this. So we will have a breathing exercise. But the first thing I need you to do is in your minds on a piece of paper that you might have taking notes on your computer. I want you to think of one student that you wanna focus in something that you can help them with today. So now that you've got that one student in mind, let's start with a breathing exercise. This is called the four by four method. And I'll explain why I use this as opposed to other methods as we continue to move through this. But like a good administrator, I'll explain why after I have you do the exercise. So what I'm going to have you do as part of the four by four method is you will inhale 
for a silent four count. Then you will hold that breath for a four count. Then you will exhale for a four count. And then you'll repeat three more times. So you do it four times altogether. And the question I'm often asked when I'm describing this is, is there a routine? Do we need to use our, our nostrils, our mouth? How do we breathe? For those of you who've done some practice breathing before, when it comes to exercises like this, I always suggest breathe in through the nostrils and out through the mouth. If you want to breathe just full mouth or for full nostrils, that's up to you. But we're going to do this four times. Ready? Begin. So at this point, many of you have completed it. Some of you are just wrapping up. Please don't feel rushed to do so. Why we use this particular breathing exercise here is we're dealing with a group that we need to kind of separate ourselves from everything else that we have going on. So whether you're about to walk into a classroom or a therapy session, whether you're about to leave a strange hotel setting that you got bounced around in and are moving somewhere else later in the day. What you wanted to do was give your body just a time to both decompress and bring your focus back in. Notice what I started with. I started with our key. And that is going to be something we come back with with our final activity, that single student. Are there other breathing activities? Yes. Some of our students can't hold for that long. Some of our students can't count to four. That's okay. Find a breathing activity that works. And the reason why we use breathing activities is for the creation of a life skill. And we're gonna talk about that in just a moment or two, but I wanna give you some foundational information that you can take and better see with your students. So what are we seeing with our students? I'm sure you're looking at this right now going, uh, yeah, we see that every single day, but you're not alone. This is what we are seeing on a national perspective. Every time I walk into a district, no matter what the state, no matter if it's urban, if it's rural, if it's suburban, these are the issues that they are seeing consistently with almost all their students. Those high levels of anxiety and stress and what we're seeing is it many times for our neurodiverse students means higher rates of escalation. And so what we want to be prepared for, and I know some of you have to deal with this every single day, is, okay, we're working with that student and suddenly there's a trigger event and they begin to escalate. And in this day, we're starting to see based on some strong anecdotal evidence that I've got, more trigger events. Here are some interesting things you might be aware of, loud sounds. Another thing that has become a trigger event that therapists throughout the country have shared with me, reaching in certain ways or losing sight of the therapist or teacher. Why? Think about that from a pandemic standpoint. That, that teacher, that therapist was being seen just like we're being seen right now. And so we want to have this differentiated awareness as we move on. Let me give you a story. As I told you, I'd share stories with you. I had an SLP from California. 
who shared with me this story. She she prefers to remain anonymous in this be, because of some of the things she did to support her students. But during the shutdown phase, she had this beautiful, young, nonverbal child that she had started to make such amazing progress with when the world kind of collapsed in March of 2020. And so one of the things she did was snuck out of her house, went over to the family's house and left a box of materials on their front porch and then went back and then did a video call. And as soon as she got on the video call and the video was shown to that beautiful young man, he escalated and would not calm down until they turned the video off. So they tried just a phone call with her voice, but as soon as her voice came through, again, the escalation, and of being nonverbal, he couldn't describe what was going on. Eventually, they learned that it was because he didn't understand everything that was happening with the shutdown and couldn't understand why people couldn't still be face to face. Unfortunately, for some of our kids, that happened a lot. But now we've moved beyond that. But what she has done since then is she incorporates virtual experiences into her therapy sessions where she might be one on one with an individual. And she's actually incorporated some of her OTs and PTs as well. You might be there in the room with them and say, the next part, we're going to be on video and I want to be able to see you do all these things. And she simply walks to the back of the room, has her phone out, and connects via video. Because what she's also doing is training, not training for another pandemic, but training for the use of virtual connections. So again, training for a life skill. And at first, teachers, parents, they were all taken aback saying, we, we never want to go into lockdown again. She said, I'm not preparing for lockdown. I'm preparing these children for the shape that our world is taking. Think about this, folks. For some of you who are going, how, how is our world taking shape like that? Look at what we're doing right now. You know, I am, as is Deb, in Florida preparing for the ATIA conference. You are back home in Oregon right now, but we're still able to have this and interact. So again, just differentiated awareness. How do we incorporate these skills? We also want to think thematically when we're dealing, especially with these students who are still trying to come back. We want to remember sensory, access, and literacy. Why those three? Because these are areas that are going to help our students, heck, help us as adults too, move and continue to move forward with things. And we're going to touch on each of those areas in kind of a group setting so you get ideas. So why the shift on the sensory side? Now, the pandemic and I'm going to use this phraseology here, and there's a lot of psychologists who purport this as well. The pandemic caused levels of PTSD on individuals. So when you take a look, if you go to, for example, the NIH, they will give you listings of especially our school nurses, our frontline, our first responders, who actually they can validate that the pandemic caused PTSD within them. Now, there are some that are saying, well, we can't say that for the world as a whole. I look at the work of Dr. Matilda Husky from the University of Bordeaux, who actually focused on whether or not we can use the designation PTSD on people. And, and there's a question whether or not the pandemic actually fits all of things. Here's what I want you to remember. The key is that trauma, the T, because one thing, and when you look at the research and the various aspects of research and how we've dealt after the pandemic with student anxiety, with social interactive anxiety that also many of our students have encountered, the research will tell you exactly the same thing. 
the best response is a trauma-informed response. That student may not, in their minds, have gone through a trauma as we define trauma. But the pandemic was a significant event that has caused follow-up anxieties. And that's what we want to be aware of. That's where those external environmental stressors have arisen from. You know, you can't get out of your room. You can't go and easily get food or access it. Well, now you can, but there's still a concern. And for some of our students, it's not even a conscious concern. Think about the work of Dr. Bruce Lipton when he speaks about you know, the energies that actually come through the body and the cells, that there are events that we may not be able to visualize, we may not be able to express, but help dictate our responses. And so many of our students, especially our younger students, haven't been able to process it or don't necessarily want to. They just kind of skim over it and move on. So that's why sensory and that sensory side is so important in this day and age. So what are some of the sensory supports we can be using? Well, we talked about breathing exercises. Breathing exercises, again, are they're a way for us to actually deal with what goes on in the world. Many of us, as we were coming up, depended upon the time and the training that we were receiving. Remember the days, well, some of us remember the days of reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. And for some of you younger folks out there, you'll need to Google that, by golly. But you remember that we were always told, count to 10 before making a response. Well, we can have breathing exercises. What the breathing is doing is calming the body. And that's a great life skill where we're not simply reacting. Yoga, simple movements in yoga, not going through very formalized movements, but simple movements in yoga can help a student try and recenter themselves. One of the caveats I give, and those of you who, who have read different things on meditation, I've had some districts that say, oh, we're going to do meditation with our students as a calming exercise. No, please don't. Here's why. And I think Brenda Wiest, in her book, uh, The Mountain is You, put this best. Meditation is an act of self-awareness. And if we try to use it as a calming experience, we defeat the purpose of meditation. Rather, start with breathing exercises and then have the student think about what triggered them. Now, for some of our students, they won't be able to think about what triggered them. And so the whole idea of the breathing or the yoga, the, the simple movements can help redirect their bodies and their minds into a calm state. We're gonna talk uh, just a little bit about the use of manipulatives. We're gonna talk about visual timers and sensory spaces. And please don't think that there are specific things I'm going to point out. No, I'll give some ideas, but folks, this ain't no sales pitch. I'm not trying to sell you something here. I'm trying to give you techniques to use. So manipulatives and visual timers. One of the things you want to be aware of is a manipulative is really there so that student can release that energy that they might be feeling. And you don't always need to have fidget spinners. Sorry, if I were still an administrator, those would not be allowed in my schools because they're too distracting to everyone else. However, manipulatives can come in other shapes and sizes. Some of you, as you're watching me, and you're lucky, Deb's seen me before in action. I have to actually stay in one place for a presentation like this. Normally, I'd be all over the room and my arms would be flailing. Most of the time, I don't jump up on chairs and tables, and that's usually a safe thing for everybody. But if you've noticed on my wrist, I have jewelry. A great manipulative that somebody could use. It doesn't make sound. It's not ostentatious. It's not going to draw up other people's attention. So many kids wear something on their wrist today. This is fine. It's acceptable. Here's something that a lot of adults use. Worry stones. 
This is just a, a stone that literally I have had since the 1990s. When I was an administrator, one of the first things I got was a worry stone. And this has been with me ever since. A little bit uh, worn down and a little cracked along the way, but I promise I haven't thrown it. Please, if you're working with, again, some type of a stone for someone to have to release that energy, make sure they are not throwers. Otherwise, it could get tossed somewhere. Other things that work, think about a sweatband, something as simple as that for some of our kids, where they can rub against the texture. I've seen some individuals that have sweatbands on and they're like, oh, it's just to wipe their mouths. Well, guess what? That's okay because sometimes this movement and feel along the cheeks and the chin actually can be a calming influence too. So a sweatband works. One of my favorite things that's out there, this is called a boink, B-O-I-N-K. And basically it's mesh with a marble inside. I can't tell you how many neurotypical individuals I've introduced this to, and they will just sit there and move that marble back and forth. And for them, it might be very relaxing. It's not making noise. It's something that I can keep down under the table in a virtual meeting or under a desk, and it's not going through. Manipulatives are also important when a child is attempting to do any type of a therapy. Guess what? It's fine motor work, first of all. But secondly, even, let's say they were working also with an SLP, it allows that excess energy to go into the manipulative and their focus to stay on the activity they're trying to accomplish. So manipulatives, especially those that are socially and classroom appropriate, are actually very good. You'll notice I've got visual timers up there. Why visual timers? Visual timers have been shown to reduce levels of anxiety. Why? Because we're not sitting there. If you have your cell phones out right now and you take a look and you're like, oh my gosh, how much longer is this guy talking? You're trying to do math at the same time. The beautiful thing about a visual timer is it is going to show the passage of time. And that's different. Your mind doesn't have to do math. Your mind takes a quick glance, and it's funny, I know some of you are going, oh, that's a nice prop. This is how I stay on time for presentations. This is how I actually run my meetings. Why? Because it allows me to make sure input can be had from those with whom I'm speaking, and we stay on time. And I'm not panicked going, okay, what time is it? I can't see anything on my computer. So that's something you want to be aware of as we go through that. Yes, visual timers actually, because they show passage of time can be a calming influence and they come in different sizes. Most people assume, oh, they're all 60 minutes. No, this one's actually 20 minutes. And I take my 20 minute one with me everywhere. Now, it's not just here because of this presentation. I chunk everything I do in the day in 20 minute segments. And it allows me again, that focus. Why is this important for our kids? It's a life skill. They have to, once they get beyond school, at least have a conscious idea of how much time they have for activities. Think about it, screen time. I know that's always an interesting thing. How do we make sure parents hold their kids to that? Again, a visual timer helps because it also distracts that visual connection too because they will look up. Just be careful though. One little tip, if you're using a visual timer with a front knob, our kids are smart. They'll figure out how to turn that knob and add extra time. But those are important things. You know, again, we're trying to get perspectives of time and life skills that can be used well beyond this. So no, I don't always have jewelry on, but I do carry the worry stone. So again, it's a life skill. The next thing people ask me about are sensory spaces, because all you hear about sometimes, when I say you, I'm talking a generalized you, not you as a group. But all that is heard is, oh, everybody needs a sensory room. Guess what? I don't know about you folks, but I've been in schools where I was lucky to have closet space sometimes, 
and didn't always have room for all my classes. And so a sensory room sometimes is inappropriate. And, and we put too much focus on that. You know, you first of all want to make sure you've got an area where individuals can calm down. Something as simple as a, a, a sensory tent where they can just go in and decompress. What's great about some sensory tents is you can also use that with your, your students who are visually impaired. One of the schools I worked with transformed their middle school hallway into a sensory hallway. And that's the picture that you see on the right-hand side there. So you've got activities that are done. And so when the students are in lines at different points in time or moving from class to class, there's expectations. When the teachers go out in the hallway, if you're in the marching lanes, you better be marching. If you're in the footprint lanes, you better be just walking along. And notice there's signs and different things on the walls that at different points in time, there's simple things like a wall push-up or simply touching along the wall. One of the things that I suggested for them as they were doing this, they wanted to add textures, but didn't want to put up carpet tiles or anything. Something simple like adding a texture, even in your own settings. You take some of the paint, you have to check with maintenance first in the facilities, folks. But you take the paint color that they're using, you take a, a core of it, and you mix it with some play sand, and then roll it on the walls. The paint actually covers some of the harshness of the sand, but still adds texture, and it all looks the same. But now what you've done is for that student that just needs some type of sensory feedback, now they have that. And so these are some simple things that you can be doing. Think about that from an OT perspective as you're looking at this hallway. The activities that go on every single day for every student. And so now some of the therapies that you might be doing that other kids turn around and say, why do you have to do that? They're doing it themselves too. And so our students, our neurodiverse students, or our students who need some of the things we're providing aren't feeling as though they're different. They're feeling as though they're getting special treatment. And that's the beautiful thing from a psychological standpoint. So understand your students, understand what they need. That again, space can be so many different things and you don't need to go out and buy something fancy create something that'll work. My two favorite things still to this day for sensory feedback are duct tape and Velcro. Duct tape works very well for our middle school and high school students. Why? Because some of them still carry around spiral notebooks. There are still districts that actually don't have everything on computers. So what you do with the duct tape is you actually run it along the spiral so that part of the tape is on both sides and the spirals covered with the duct tape. And when I say duct tape, use the old school stuff, the stuff that has a little bit of a pattern, you know, nothing shiny, nothing fancy. Because what happens is when the, their peers actually see the notebooks with the duct tape, they go, oh yeah, my cover came off too. So it's a perception that there's nothing different about it, but guess what's happening? They are getting feedback and they can rub their hand along that where they're not rubbing against the harshness of that spiral. And so it's just another way to add a depth to sensory feedback. Velcro, we can't always simply put it underneath the desk, but you know where we can put Velcro? We could put, oh, sorry about that. Uh, that's letting me know I need to move to the next slide. We could put Velcro on a book cover, right on the binder. That way, when a student has that book sitting on their desk, they can reach up and get feedback from the Velcro, and it's not standing out to their peers. So we want to think about that when it comes to sensory. Ray, I have a, a comment. I know you mentioned um, uh, OTs, and of course, sensory is a huge part of OT, but right. I'm thinking uh, uh, we have a number of PTs on as well who are probably thinking about some strategies, but even looking at that sensory hallway and helping uh, kids who are uh, you know, accessing their environment, um, it, 
being able to participate in some of these activities may be something motivational uh, that when you're working with them as a PT to help them um, to navigate, but also uh, they, if they have stand or if they have wheelchair, uh, any of those uh, pieces of equipment, putting some of those sensory things on there, uh, I, I would think would be good too, because it, like you said, it brings them to focus um, and helps reduce anxiety. Now for the rest of the group here, this is why I love interacting with Deb. Deb is always thinking through all of the angles, you know, in, in thinking about her kids and what she'd be doing, thinking about you too. Deb, you're absolutely right. You know, again, this is why it's so important to understand there's no one size fits all, but there's activities that can that can flow. So yeah, I, I think you're spot on with that. And PTs, yes, adapt it to where you're at. Think about the levels that we've got these things now. Some of those are at levels that would be great for a wheelchair. But if you've got a child in a standard, don't be afraid to have things up a little higher. And here's the beautiful thing. You might be saying, okay, well, we've got that up a little higher for our students in standards. What about the rest of the students? Some of them, the neurotypical ones, may need to jump a little bit, or our taller students just reach up and do it. But again, it, it's a consistent activity. It's not that people are doing it and other people can't. We want to make it as inclusive as well as as accessible as possible. So great, Deb. Thank you. So the reason that my little sound went off there on my visual timer was to remind us it's time for activity two. And this is a quick refocus activity. I love this one because, again, it can be done anywhere. A couple of different activities here. As I did before, we're going to go through the activity, then I'll explain why. So what's going to happen is I'm just going to have you right now. If you've got armrests, put your arms and hands on your armrests. If it's just a chair, put your hands on the seat of the chair. Once you've got them there, I want you to push up three times. So go ahead and do that. Then what I want you to do is I want you to cross your arms like this, squeeze and give yourself a hug. Now out loud, I want you to say, today is a good day. And then end it by taking your arms, putting them above your head and clapping them together. So, what we did in that activity was several things. The chair push-ups are oftentimes a great activity to get the body moving again after we've been sitting for a little bit. They're great for fidgeters. Some of you that have to sit through some of these uh, meetings with parents and that know that virtual meetings can be painful for us sometimes. So a chair push-up is a great way to get the body and blood flowing again. What we did when we crossed arms, hello folks, we crossed midline. We squeezed, we gave ourselves an auditory positive affirmation, and then we brought our hands up and clapped. Again, we're hitting midline, but that action, that touch helps to reinforce everything we just did. That's why it's important. You know, simple activities can sometimes get everybody redirected into the way they need to go. Access. Obviously, things are so different. You know, they, they really have been different. A lot of times you will get information coming in. Both the OTs, the PTs, even the SLPs will hear, oh, we got the latest and the greatest. No. The latest and the greatest isn't always the best and isn't always going to work for everybody. I can't tell you even before the pandemic, but after the pandemic, how many companies have approached me and said, hey, we've got this absolutely phenomenal thing. We'd like you to try it. We'd like you to endorse it. My first question always is, tell me about the research. And that's usually when they hang up the phone. Why? Because right now, unfortunately, there's a lot of groups out there that are trying to capitalize on the whole idea of access by just designing stuff that works. And who do they test it out on? Nine times out of 10, they test it on someone who's neurotypical. Well, let's try this out for a wheelchair person, but we've got somebody here, sit in this wheelchair and see if you can reach this or see if you can interact with this. 
the good companies actually will be using the people that are going to use this. That's why I love the picture on the right there. This is this was actually one of our AT groups that designed a way for this young man, cerebral palsy, about 23 years old, and he loves gaming. But gaming was very restrictive for him. Right now with that setup that you see in front of him. So he's got a joystick. He's got a couple of switches put together. He's also got some other interactive pieces. He's actually playing on an Xbox. And the funniest part is what you're not seeing on this. You see the, the gentleman who's working with him to get everything set up, smiling and they're laughing. The guy on the other side is a neurotypical individual playing against him and getting crushed and he's trying that's the beautiful aspect that sometimes it's just access so don't be afraid to ask questions to people you trust hey what's another way to access hey you know what we used to use product x is that still the best way to go or is there something else and the reason I say this, and I'm keeping it generic, is simply because there, there are a lot of things out there. And so when you're, when you're reaching out, the questions that should be asked of you is, first and foremost, you're asking, let's say it's for the little girl on the left side. She's in a wheelchair and we need better access. The first question should be, what are her strengths? Because then that person helping you is going to be able to say, okay, here's some things right off that can help. The second question is, should be how does she access computers, uh, things on the screen, other types of daily activities right now? Because then what you're starting to do is you start from their strength and you begin to move towards, okay, what's going to work, not just here, but for life, not just in this one case, but overall. And that's what we wanna keep in mind as we move forward. Tools for access. Oh, there are all kinds of tools out there. So again, what you want to do is find somebody you trust, find somebody you can talk to. You've got some excellent groups out there right now. You know, at the end of this, I will be more than happy to, you know, you will have my email as part of this, but I'm more than happy to give feedback. I always warn people though, be careful when you get feedback. It might be at an unusual hour because I travel a lot throughout the country. So I'm answering emails at all kinds of hours. So just be aware of that, but I have no problems, but I'm gonna ask questions first because there can never be a one size fits all. So what are the things that we're looking for access for? Computer controls and settings. Here's a myth that's out there, and I'm going to reiterate uh, this myth in just a few minutes. Just give them an iPad. iPads do everything in this day and age. No! iPads are phenomenal tools. I've got one in my bag over there. There's so many things I can do with it. It's not an all-in-one tool. First and foremost, iPads, even though now the ability to access, the ability to have additional things come in, have been added because of their interactions with the neurodiverse populations. But iPads and tablets themselves were still designed for the neurotypical population. It's absolutely wild. Things that are designed for the neurotypical population need to be adjusted to help the neurodiverse. Things that are designed for the neurodiverse populations are more easily, not always, but more easily generalizable. And so we want to keep that in the back of our mind. So computer access, how are we getting that access? What needs to happen? Is it an eye gaze? Is it a head movement? Is it something even like a, a, a fluttering? There are different things that allow that access. And that ties into switches and alternative controls. A, a wonderful alternative control in this day and age is your voice. So we can use that along the way. Literacy tools. Oh my goodness, when you look at literacy, especially when, as we're dealing with students that are having reading issues, if you've looked at some of the reading scores, you've seen they've gone down, especially after the pandemic. And that's because reading instruction 
just was inconsistent at that time because we couldn't get and make sure that the reading was being done properly. But where you need to be cautious is there's all kinds of reader pens out there. They're all very good for their set areas. And so you want to be able to speak to people and say, okay, here's what I've got. I've got these students that need this. These are their strengths. It's going to work best. There are some things that are out there that are absolutely amazing, but literally at $2,000, not worth it. There are some things that are out there that for $150 are going to be able to stay with that individual forever. And that's what we want to look at too. So literacy tools, what are those things that'll best support the individual? And when we're talking literacy, because again, this is an issue, don't forget our manipulatives. There's nothing wrong with poly letters or having, you know, what I've got a picture of there too, those little stones or alphabet pebbles. I love those. Why? Because you can manipulate. Sorry, uh, you know, I am going to share another story. I love this story. It's, it's just so amazing. And, and I'm conscious of our time. But I was working with a high school history teacher. And it was absolutely amazing the story he told me. He had a young man in his class, and forgive me for getting choked up, but this is just unbelievable. Young man in his class that had severe apraxia, both physical and verbal. And so movements were very difficult as well as speaking. But he knew that this young man was brilliant. So one day he just got a bunch of, uh, of these stones and he himself before class spelled out a quote. And so as students were walking into his class, he started handing them three or four stones, depending on the number of students in the classroom. And this is the exact instructions he gave to his class. He shared this with me because he wanted to show the power of what happened. He said, all of you, as you walked into class today, got three or four stones. When you put those stones together correctly, they spell out a quote that will be the theme of our next unit in this class. I'm going to time, and he had a, a stopwatch, I'm going to time how long it takes you to put it together. I'm not going to give any other instructions. I'm going to choose somebody at random today. You know what, Tommy, Tommy, why don't you lead? Tommy, of course, is the young man with, with apraxia. Why don't you lead the group today? All right, I'm going to get going. Ready, Tommy, all set, go. And he said at first, Tommy's eyes got really, really big. No one had ever called on him before. But then all of a sudden he said, Tommy stood up and started waving his arms like this. And the teacher's like, oh my gosh, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I kind of let it play out. So Tommy stands up and he's doing this and the class got it. They all came to the front of the room. And, and Tommy started at that point in time pointing to people. And, and at least trying to get the letter, A, A, uh, N. And in seven minutes and 28 seconds, they had spelled out the first two lines from the preamble for the Constitution of the United States. What class was this? This was an advanced placement government class at the high school level for 12th graders. Tommy did get a five on that test, which is the highest score you can get. But think of the power of something as simple as that. Folks, sometimes we overthink too. We're trying to get fancy. That teacher still to this day, that actually happened five years ago. And I have followed up on things. Tommy right now went to college. He's an instructor. He is a teacher, a history teacher at a high school. But that instructor still uses, he uses different quotes, but still uses the stones every single semester. And the kids love it, but different quotes. So again, we incorporate the sensory side. So quick myths, and then I wanna to get to your questions. Kids are resilient, they'll be fine. No, they won't. They're gonna appear resilient because they haven't learned to complain like some of us adults have. But. We want to be there for them now. We want to give them the life skills that they can begin to actually calm themselves, to begin to express in whatever way they need to, sometimes set energetic express. 
I mentioned this one already. Give them an iPad and they'll be able to do everything. No, excuse me, they won't. We need to make sure if it's information on the iPad, they have access to it no matter what. And there are tools that can help us with that. And then the final one, the device works for everybody else with similar issues. We hear this sometimes from our insurance companies. No, one size does not fit all. One size fits one. And then we'll see what adapt adaptations we need to make for others. So our final activity, I want you to think of that student that you identified at the beginning and whether you feel comfortable writing it down or just in your mind, creating it there. But one idea that you got from today that might be good to try with them. And then when you finish, and I'm not gonna ask you to unmute right now, but when you finish, say out loud, I got this and simply clap your hands together. So I'll give you just a, a moment to do that. So there will be some silence here. I know that's hard to, you know, after you've heard me speak and ramble on, but I will give you some time for that. All right, I saw Deb finish. Well done, Deb. Let's now, quick recap, then I'm gonna open it up to questions. Our students are in a different environment. And when I say that, the ecosystem might look the same, but the anxiety, that's what we're concerned about and those stress levels that go in. We wanna keep the themes of sensory access and literacy up. So as you're doing things, again, incorporate whatever you need to incorporate for that student. And sometimes simple is fine. There's no one size fits all approach to this. Look at holistic approaches. You know, this is not just about getting a student to learn how to do a three point grip. This is about giving the student the ability to utilize tools that will help them communicate for the rest of their lives. The most important thing, and I don't have this here because I like to actually share it at the very end. The most important thing in all this, don't forget yourself. Take five minutes every day. I know you're gonna go, but you don't understand my schedule. No, I don't. But I do understand this, if you take five minutes, whether it's a very early morning, the end of the day, just five minutes, take a, a, a hot cup of tea, just sit down, breathe deep and relax. It will help set that foundation for you to go out and do amazing things with all of your students. So with that, what questions can I address for you? As you're thinking of questions, think of students. If you have somebody who you, uh, something resonated with you in uh, Dr. Hype's uh, um, uh, presentation, share how that worked for that student. If you have a student who you're not really sure how to work with or has some uh, stresses, anxieties, share the profile of that student. And we as a group might think of some things that we talked about today that would be um, would be good for you to trial. Y'all got this. You know that. You know your students. Um, one thing that resonated with me, Ray, is when you were talking about the timers and a beginning and an ending time. And I know uh, I have a six-year-old granddaughter. <laughs> yes, I know that. Uh, I have a six-year-old granddaughter. And whenever she wants iPad time, and let's say her dad hands her the iPad and, okay, you're good to go, there's almost always a bit of resistance whenever it's time to give the iPad back. 
And so I started with her um, and before I hand her my phone, I say, okay, well, let's set your timer first. So she knows now how to go into the phone and set the timer. And so I say, okay, how many minutes do you think you want today? Uh, and then we negotiate. And, and uh, so, okay, you get 16 minutes today. And so she sets that timer. And as soon as the timer goes off, she hands it back to me. And, oh. and it's okay. I had 16 minutes, but like you said, it's hard to really know the passage of time and okay, you've got 15 minutes on this. I have no idea what that means, but some students I have seen that they get a little anxious because they keep watching the timer and it, it distracts them. But and like you said, one size does not fit all, but I just wanted to say that because I see no meltdowns with my granddaughter whenever she has uh, technology time, when she knows um how to set the timer herself what what a great story thank you for sharing that deb i mean that's that's what we're doing and you just gave her a life skill that is just so amazing and that's what we want to be considering and you're absolutely right on the other hand you know again a child watching a visual timer there there may be some that get anxious because of it you know we just we know our individuals we know what's going to work what I love, Deb, about your example is you've taught her to set the timer on the phone. Wow. How powerful is that? Now, again, a life skill and is relying on the auditory feedback, probably, which is calming in some ways because you're not sitting there going, how much time do I have left? You're able to focus and you know something's going to trigger for you later on. Great. Thank you. So we have a, a bit of time left. We have about 15 minutes left for anyone who would like to share stories. Ray, if you wanted to sh stop sharing your screen so we can see oh, folks, um, then it, 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 feel free uh, to jump out with questions. Chandra, I see that you unmuted yourself. Yeah, um, my daughter's uh, elementary school, way back when she was in elementary school, they had a like a yoga class in the morning, like first thing in the morning. Um, do you find that that sort of a program really does help out, like with the kids transitioning into school? So what we tend to find, whether it be yoga, um, I've had some schools that have used music, but something to help them just kind of settle. That's always a good way to start the day. And, and here's why. We want to think about it from our students' perspectives. Number one, they're coming in, they're either being dropped off, you know, through the, the drop-off line, which is always an adventure in itself, or are taking the bus in. And so you've had that bus ride, which depending on the bus, depending on, on what's going on, how many students, all that, that can be mildly put a cacophony of sound coming in. So there can be a lot of overwhelm that comes in with that type of transition. And so by starting something with a yoga, with a music, with just some kind of quick calming, instead of coming in and saying, okay, books out, here we go. It offers a naturalized transition. Now, is that going to be good for everybody? No. And I'll tell you who oftentimes will see your high, your top end cognitive students want to get right to, right to school because they're excited about that. And that's great. But what we want to do with that is recognize, too, that, you know what, take that deep breath. We're doing a focusing right now and we're going to get ready to study. And by explaining it to that to them in that way, that may help them, too, because at some points in time, we don't want them to get to that high school level, that collegiate level. And they've got a presentation that's due or test sets due and suddenly have test anxiety, suddenly have presentation anxiety. You know, we want them to be able to come in and say, okay, I've got everything prepared. I'm going to do my relaxation and now go. So I think that some type of transition is important. We've just got to, again, meet the best needs of our students. And you're the ones that would know best. Excellent question. Thank you.
I certainly don't want to monopolize the conversation, but as others are thinking of things, uh, in, in our worlds, we've been talking about transportation and uh, bus transportation and emergency planning and all of those things. And, uh, you know, so many times over the years, our students who are neurodiverse have been given somewhat of a by a pass uh, from participating in drills and, and those kind of things because of their sensory uh, issues. And so um, in, in your experience, is there something, you know, of course, just regular bus transportation, as you were just talking about, and the getting on and getting off and all of those sounds and things that go along with that, there are things that can help in calming. But I'm just wondering, can you think of things that might be um, appropriate in in emergency situations uh, as we are trying to help our kids get used to those things because if they don't have anything in their memory banks uh, the actual emergencies are not the time uh, for them to to be fully included thank you for bringing that up this is something now i think is really starting to come to a higher level of awareness with our schools, we can, are concerned about that, but not all the time is the rest of our district administration. Not because they don't care, just because they're trying to make sure they're protecting the whole. So a couple of things right off the bat, I've worked with some districts where they have put together both for buses and for emergency settings, basically a sensory kit. What is, ooh, what's a sensory kit? It's a backpack where you take some sensory items and you you put in what you've got. You might have some squeeze balls, you might have, you might have some boinks, you might have some things, something weighted. You know, what unfortunately you don't see right here, my friend Iggy, who is a weighted iguana, oftentimes he accompanies me on things. He's out in the van right now. Um, don't worry, I left the windows open. So one of the things, though, you, you've got that weighted thing that's in there, too. So now you've got on a bus a backpack that the driver can simply pull out and say, here, you know what, this, this is an emergency. I want you to hold this in, in, and let the child pick, you know, what's going to work best for them. And it really takes just a couple of minutes to put the backpack together within our buildings. The first thing, please. Oh, my gosh. Uh, again. I'll share a story in a moment. Make sure you've got evac chairs that are available on the floors in the stairwells. Why is that? I worked with a district where they had this beautiful young lady who was in a power wheelchair because she literally was born with only one limb. And because she was also very intelligent, she was in advanced classes and they were on the second floor of her high school. Their emergency evacuation plan for her was to have one of the male teachers pick her up and carry her down the stairs. <laughs> yeah, yes, that was, I, I might have offered a word or two, too, along with that type of response. But make sure you've got evac chairs there. And along with that, what I tell people is an evac chair normally has a cover. Take another one of those backpacks and put that right there. Because again, as that student's going down the stairs, as you're wheeling them, they can be holding something that's weighted or squeezing a squeeze therapy ball. It's very important to have that. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, another concrete example. Um, I work also with a lot of groups that support our individuals on the autism spectrum. And I had a mother share this with me. She has a beautiful young man, um, who's 23 now, six foot two, 235 pounds, and is on the, if we look under the DSM-4 standards, he would be more in the full autism category. He's able to do some things, likes to go down the street to his local library, and literally will pick out the kids' picture books. And that's okay, the librarians love him, they think he's great, but he, he's a very large boy. One day, he was going into the library and the fire alarm was sounding. And a firefighter who had shown up there yelled at him, don't go in that door. And he got scared and ran. Ran down a side street, 
and started pacing in front of a house that was not his. And the person on the inside was an elderly person who was frightened. There's this six foot two, 235 pound young man pacing in front of her house. She called the police. And so when the police came there, the first squad car that showed up, gentleman came out and said, you need to stop. You need to. And fortunately, just behind him was a second squad car. And, 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 the, and the young man started to escalate even more. And as the first police officer was actually reaching for his service revolver, the second police officer got out of the car and said, stop, reached in his back seat, pulled out. He just had a, a simple weighted lap pad. Walk, started walking over and said, hi, I want to hand you this blanket. Let's sit down and talk. It's okay. I just want to hand you this blanket. And the young man sat down, put the blanket on, and started rocking. And the police officer said, are you okay? Here's the difference between the two officers. The second one had a child who was on the spectrum and always carried that around, recognized right away. And from that, that particular police department started going through autism training, and they all have something like that. So the, there are reasons, realize this too, and why I bring this up now, by having those backpacks in different areas, on a bus, in a hallway, when you've got that child that breaks away and is going somewhere, it's easy to grab and follow because that's what we need to call. Excellent, an excellent example of that. You know, in our planning and, uh, you know, oftentimes our PTs, and there's variability across our state, but oftentimes it's our PTs who are uh, charged with writing those uh, emergency plans and often in a vacuum without the help of the emergency people. But I often wonder that too. And I, I, I would like to see uh, some of the big communication boards on the sides of our police cars or on our uh, fire engines, whatever so that they you know you can start to uh, communicate with them and in our plan and we planning we talk about the need for the student to have a go bag and in an emergency what is it that you're going to need and so that's you know there may be a fidget or something that needs to be in there but I like what you're talking about especially the part about training people so they know that your revolver is not your first always your first um, response but also uh, to have something available um, at, at the ready for that kind of thing. So I was thinking something that was with the student, but I love what you're saying about having it readily available and letting people know that it's there. So you always have something that you can pull out in calming. So I love that story. Oh, thank you. I, I want to, and why I think it's important to have this idea of something accessible, and I've shared this with other districts too. We always, and, and Deb, your alignment of having something specific to that student, yes, that's important. And they might have something, and that's great. What we can't forget is that sometimes as we're having an emergency, it might also be a trigger for a neurotypical individual, and they won't have anything. And if we could see that, hey, they're escalating, they might need something as simple. Again, I, I don't want to downplay the importance of any type of sensory materials, but something as simple as a weighted lap pad could make all the difference in the world. You know, having a stuffed animal that has a little bit of weight to it and they suddenly hug it, you know, a little cat or a little dog that can be that calming influence for anyone. I love that. And I, in the part that you're saying about um, being able to hug it, how many of us have gone to build a bear and they, uh, you know, you put together your own stuffy and I, I avoid those at all costs. They're never cheap, but you are allowed to put in a recording. And so what if your mother put in uh, you put a v recording that said it's all going to be okay right something like that that now in addition to the stuffy when i squeeze it it's got my mom's voice That's wouldn't good. that be cool yeah wow wow 
See, these are the things you should be out there. One of those companies doing some of this stuff by golly. (laughs) (laughs) Ray, I'd love to talk, but, uh, (laughs) but I love the conversation that we're having. I love that folks have joined us for this. We had a great group with us today. And I, so I know that it's something that people are thinking about. It's on their minds. And, uh, you know, I hear uh, whenever I say, well, what are you seeing in your classroom? A lot of our therapists have been saying, I'm seeing COVID babies. And so that, what does that mean? That means a lot of things. It means that they came through COVID without socialization. It could also mean that they came through without having access to uh, doctors because they couldn't get to a doctor. Uh, I, we're seeing kids who are coming back to the classroom who've never really been socialized. And now they're in kindergarten and have never uh, had a trip to the library and those kind of things. And anybody who wants to uh, add to that list, increase CVI. Yes, yes, a lot, uh, very much so, Chandra. Thank you for that. And so when we think about these kids coming to us on their very first day with us, you've got so many challenges and how to ease the anxieties. and, and, you know, I, I hear a lot of our adults and our therapists even saying that they have uh, long COVID symptoms and um, that they, too, feel something that feels like PTSD. It puts you in a whole different level. So I love that you're talking about us as adults and individuals and those same things. Our kids are little adults. That one day they're going to be us. And if we don't find ways to help them, and Chandra, I see you put in their OGCOM. Absolutely. If I can't express myself, I might need something that is temporary or it could be ongoing. But the you know, in years ago when you and I were in school, Ray, um <laughs> it you know, better seen than heard and, you know, quiet bodies and make sure you're, uh, you're making eye contact and, and all of these things, they just don't fit everybody. And sometimes what we're doing is more uh, adding more trauma. And then school becomes uh, the traumatic experience whenever we don't find ways for our kids to cope. And so um, there you go. So uh, that's just a comment and just thinking that it's all of us. Everybody um, has been through trauma. And so thank you so much for being here, Ray. I certainly appreciate your being ready. Uh, you, Some of you may know that I had a different um we were talking about having uh, Eli Sanders and uh, talking about the house bill and uh, that needs to just get out there and let people. And I just, it was only minutes after I asked uh, Ray, could he be here? And he was all over it. One thing I love about you and your presentation, Ray, is how much it, it's so evident that you care about the kids. And we have a group of people on with us today um, who shares that. And we value all that they um, that they do because they are on the front lines of access and making sure kids get what they need. And see, Tara, yeah, you may want to unmute yourself to talk about this, but Hero Kids Registry is for first responders to be alerted about students and people with special needs who may be out wandering or lost in the community so they're not in danger of police not understanding their needs. That's awesome. That is so awesome, and it, it's something I um, I would like to do more uh, uh, research on. But uh, and we have been working with the folks who at state level. Some of you um, have been part of our conversations with Alex Hayslip, and and they are talk at, at the state level, talking uh, to communities and trying to bring together the uh, communities and planning for uh, education, including all the stakeholders. And so when you've got something like that, Tara, the Hero Kids. Uh, I, I'm not sure how people are accessing it. Uh, it's something they almost need to do in advance, um, but to to recognize that people's responses in those situations are are not textbook. You know, I'm a picture of what I have been through, and you know, sometimes whenever we go into lockdown or or whatever in our schools. Um, if somebody doesn't have an experience, I've heard of kids who just 
were just con- uncontrollably laughing at a time whenever they should been have been uh, quiet um, and trying to stay um, to stay inconspicuous. So all of these conversations are just so valuable. And that's why I love to bring it about um, and make sure that we're having them before we get to the to crisis time. And Ray, again, thank you so much for being here today. And everyone, thank you for joining us. And thank you for the jobs that you do all the time. If you have additional questions or think of something that you should have asked Ray, well, I believe Ray's given us his information, uh, but you also um, can let me know and I'll be in contact with Ray. We want to make sure that you feel supported in all that you do.